And let's begin. So welcome everyone to part two of the transistor workshop. Uh, so last week we went over uh, more of the theory of transistors as well as some of them like uh, the differences between BJTs and MOSFETs. Uh, this week we'll be going more, more over CMOS design, uh, the use of them, how they can be used for logic design, etc. cetera. Uh, CMOS stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor and obviously uses uh, MOSFETs uh, for logic design. So uh, they use complementary uh, both PMOS and NMOS so that they uh, can be used to different types of logic. So let's start with going over a little bit, show a couple of the diagrams that we used last time and um, how this plays into CMOS. So last time we showed the CMOS inverter, you can see that on the left. Uh, and basically we had uh, one of the different, one of the MOSFETs had a little circle on it and the bottom MOSFET did not have a circle on it. And so uh, what this means is the difference between a, a, a PMOS, so like a, the channel is made of holes, and an NMOS, so the channel is made of electrons. And so you can see uh, on the bottom right, there are two different ones. The, obviously, uh, the source and drain are P pluses, and then the source and drain are N pluses. And so for the N plus uh, MOSFET that you see on the left, the left one, uh, the electrons would be used as a channel, making this an NMOS. So this would be the bottom half of the inverter. There's no bubble there. Uh, NMOSs don't need a bubble, and then the bubble is uh, represents a PMOS, so that'd be the right one where the channel is holes. And so uh, how you can kind of think of that, we kind of went over how you can simplify a MOSFET uh, to be used as an electronic switch. Uh, if the NMOS receives a logic one or a high voltage on the gate, then the electrons flow up and allow the channel to rise, meaning it's a closed switch. Uh, oppositely, if the PMOS, so the holes are the channel, uh, receives a, a ground, it's grounded, the gate is grounded, and there's a logic zero connected to the gate, uh, the, then the gate is closed. So they're opposite. If one, for the NMOS, if a one is received, then the switch is closed and the, uh, the electrons flow. And for the PMOS, if a zero is received, then the gate is, uh, then the, it actually works, the switch is closed and the, uh, it is able to flow throughout. And so we have a, a pull-up circuit and a pull-down circuit in the CMOS. And so the pull-up circuit is the PMOS uh, version of the CMOS. So in this case, uh, it, it's just the one transistor on the top. And then the pull-down circuit is the bottom half of all of it. And you'll see that they kind of replicate each other, uh, the both pull-up and pull-down. They act a little differently, but uh, they, once you know the logic of one, you're able to apply it to the logic of the other. Um, and so why do we have this? Obviously a pull up circuit is pulling up the output of Q in the left diagram to uh, the value of VDD, while a pull down circuit is applying it to the value of VSS, which in most cases is cases is ground. So that's why it's pull, pull down because it's actually pulling down the output vol voltage and pull up uh, is pulling up the output voltage. And so what this ends up happening is this makes the uh, operation of CMOS transistors and the CMOS logic naturally inverted. Uh, so whatever we end up designing, if we try and uh, I'll show you a couple different gates and then we'll go through an example of our own. Uh, but if whatever you end up designing, basically it makes it inverted. So if I was to design uh, and, and if I wanted to design an AND gate with uh, the logic that I'll show you, the, the process that we want to choose, uh, it'll end up being a NAND gate because uh, it ends up just being naturally inverted because of that PMOS, uh, the pull up and pull down networks that are created from CMOS. And so why is, why are we, why do we end up doing this? Why do we have those pull up networks and pull down networks when we could just switch it, use an NMOS at the top and a PMOS on the bottom, and then it'd be technically an, uh, a buffer instead of an inverter. Because uh, if you apply a one to A, then the um, NMOS is closed. And in this case, Q is equal to zero, it's connected to VSS. Uh, but if you uh, switched it, then it'd be connected to VCC and it'd be a buffer. So you would input one at the output or at the input, and then Q would be one at the output. Now, why do we do this? Does everyone understand uh, everything I, I just said before I go on? The pull up networks, the pull down networks, et cetera. All right. Yes, we do. Perfect. Yes, sir. Um, let me move this down. 
so why we have those pull down and pull, uh, pull up circuits uh, are mainly because of the threshold voltage that is needed for the actual MOSFETs to operate. So because uh, they are diodes and we, uh, we have those PNN junctions, uh, it takes, for most uh, diodes, it takes 0 0.7 volts for them to actually activate. If we have anything below that in, in the diode equation, then no current's gonna actually flow. So we need a difference from 0 0.7 volts from the gate to the volt, uh, from the gate to the voltage that's actually flowing through, or else we're going to end up getting uh, a, a false, we're going to end up having that difference caused by the diode. And so if we were to use an NMOS uh, as a pull-up circuit, uh, we'd have a one connected to the gate, uh, but VDD is flowing through the, uh, the actual MOSFET as well. So because there has to be a difference between the gate and the voltage that flows through the MOSFET, it would be VDD or uh, VCC as I li uh, listed, minus the 0.7 volts that uh, goes through the actual PN junction. And so uh, the same is done with the pull down circuit. And so if we were to uh, have a PMOS on the bottom because we apply a zero to it, uh, there has to be a 0.7 difference for the actual the, the threshold voltage to be activated and the MOSFETs to be uh, able to actually be used. And so uh, to avoid this 0.7 difference, so we don't have that 0.7 drop and then 0.7 gain in the output values and make sure that, that it actually represents the values that we want them to, we use a PMOS as the pull-up circuit and an NMOS as the pull-down circuit, kind of making it, um, so we're able to get our values, but it does make, make it uh, invertive at the end. And then if we were, uh, if we did want uh, the invert, as you'll see later in our design, you can just invert the output using uh, that inverter that we showed previously uh, to get the value that you wanted immediately. Let's say you wanted a NAND gate, but then you wanted to invert it. You could always just put an inverter at the end and it becomes a NAND gate. So uh, kind of the logic for NAND gates and NOR gates, uh, and this is basically the foundation of what you like need to know when you're actually designing. Uh, because everything can be made from basically these two gates. Uh, for, for a NAND gate, you have uh, basically the two inputs in parallel in the pull up circuit, and then uh, you have them in series in the pull down circuit. So the NMOSs, as you see here, are in series. And then for a uh, NOR gate, uh, you have them oppositely. You have them in series in the pull up circuit and uh, in parallel in the pull down circuit. And so you kind of uh, use this logic and we'll use it in our own example to uh, make whatever outcome that you want. And uh, like I said, how you can use these to um, make different types of uh, gates and circuits. You can make uh, NAND gates and NOR gates uh, out of each other. You can make a, an OR gate into a NAND gate, et cetera, depending on how you want to use it using De Morgan's theorem. Uh, but if you, uh, for here an exclusive OR gate, uh, it can also be represented in uh, different types of NAND gates and NOR gates. And you can see here is an example of a CMOS design of an exclusive OR gate. Just a little more complicated, but showing how uh, you're able to kind of get the same effect uh, with using the, the different gates of NAND and NOR. Any questions? All right. So we're gonna go through an example. Uh, the example we're gonna kind of use, if you wanted to make a, uh, a chip, uh, for our use, for simple purposes, we're going to have a chip, a chip with four inputs, three of them uh, that we're going to say control an output in this case, which would be a light. Uh, one of them is a master switch, meaning that it doesn't matter any of the other inputs. If this one is not on, then the output, then the light will not be on no matter what. And then if any of the three switches that uh, are on and the master switch is on, then the, um, then the output is on. So basically that master switch needs to be on. It's kind of like a breaker in a house. You can think of, think of it as uh, if the breaker is turned off, then none of the light bulbs work in uh, attached to that circuit. And then if any of the light switches are turned on uh, in this uh, particular example, then you would, um, then the light would be turned on. Obviously you could have in a house, you would have it that one switch uh, turns off if it's already on. But for simplicity sakes, we'll say if any of those switches are turned on, then the, the light switch is turned on. And so the first step in any design, you would go through all the different outcomes, uh, different possibilities and the different outcomes. So basically uh, D in this case is our master switch. So at any point that D is um, zero, then the output can't be zero. That breaker is turned off and uh, it only can be activated if it is one, 
and you see that uh, the only possibility here that the breaker is closed so that the switch is closed and uh, none of the lights are turned on is that second option uh, on the on the chart on the left. And then every other option, if one of the light switches are turned on ABC, uh, if there's a one in any of them, then the output is one. And so obviously we learned uh, this kind of gets back to what we connected in um, 201 and kind of connecting all of it so that you were going to get to be able to actually create our CMOS design and then you put it into a, you design into an actual chip and then you'll send it out to a fat house for it to be created. So obviously we make the K map to, to start with and uh, I'm not going over a review of how these operate, uh, but basically we make the K map, we input our different uh, ones and zeros that we want to be implemented into the specific um, that we want to be implemented in the circuit. And obviously you can input any amount of variables depending on your design. Uh, it just depends on what you really want to create. There's infinite possibilities for this. And so it can go from those, uh, it can be a binary decoder from uh, those chips that were given in 201. It can be an adder, it can be a whole bunch of different functions. And these functions are created and then added into whatever uh, different chip that you are using. Uh, that, from our phones to those FPGAs that we have to use, they all have those different functions and uh, kind of you kind of are able to create them, uh, you learn in the CMOS design. But we use the KMAP design to input all our inputs, our, all our outputs, and then we obviously combine them using fours, uh, in this case fours, uh, multiples of twos, or, or uh, not multiples, but uh, you can do two, four, eight, 16, et cetera. Uh, and that you circle them and then you combine them. And we see here that the output uh, from all of this, we get A ORD with B ORD with C all ANDed with D. And so there's a couple ways that we're able to do this. Obviously we could use De Morgan's theorem to get anything that uh, we actually, we can get a whole bunch of NAND gates. We can get, uh, we could get a combination of NAND and NORS, uh, et cetera. But also what we're able to end up doing is um, Create it, create it how we want, uh, just trying to making OR gates and NAND gates, do kind of OR all the ABCs and then NAND it with B. And because it's naturally invertive, this would just be the knot of A plus B plus C uh, ANDed with B. And so at the end, we would just add an inverter. So this would get us the result that we actually end up wanting to get. And so we see here what I end up doing, because if you remember, the NAND gates are parallel in the pull up circuit uh, and the NAND gates are, uh, or uh, the OR gates are um, parallel in the pull down circuit, and then the NAND gates are in series in the pull down circuit, and then the NOR gates are uh, in series in the pull up circuit. As we, I ended up doing here is I ended up just combining it. I look at that A plus B plus C uh, D uh, ANDed with D, and I uh, kind of just use that formula or kind of use the logic that was we were shown earlier. And uh, we and all of them, we, I do the A plus B plus C, and then I and it with the D. So you see the A plus B plus C is all uh, in series in the pull-up circuit. And then I have it in parallel with the, the D because they're, they're anded together. And then oppositely on the bottom, and you can kind of see how they work complementary to one another. Uh, because they're all in series on the pull-up circuit, you uh, put them in parallel in the pull down circuit. And because D and then all the other outputs are in parallel in the pull up circuit, you put them in series in the pull down circuit. And so uh, you can kind of just create the pull up or the pull up circuit. And then uh, from that, you are able to create the pull down circuit. And so that can kind of be your guide. And so what we get from this after inputting all the inputs, uh, as I kind of showed in this chart, is it is inverted. We end up getting the opposite of uh, what we want. And so what we, what we want to end up doing is inverting this so that we get the, uh, Kate, the different outputs that we want from all our different inputs. Any questions? All right. So like I said, we just adding, uh, this is just adding an inverter at the end of it uh, so that uh, the output becomes inverted and then we have the specific A plus B plus C uh, ended with B uh, for this specific output. So once we end up getting this design, we wanna end up creating the actual uh, different layout for it so that uh, this is the layout that we are able to measure the size of the uh, MOSFET, optimize the size, as well as send it out uh, to the fab houses, uh, put it in an actual uh, fabrication of it so that it's able to be used. So there's a process of normally doing this and 
normally how you would end up doing this is you first start by doing the VCC in ground rails. Uh, so in this case, I just draw VCC in ground so that we're able to see, and that's where we're gonna connect to. Uh, VCC is connected to this uh, schematic. Uh, we don't control any of the inputs to this. Uh, we just show the basically in of this uh, chip that we're adding. And so this, now we're actually designing how the chip is gonna be laid out and how the fab house is going to create it. And so uh, we first draw the VCC and ground rails, and then we uh, end up uh, drawing the transistors. So uh, in this schematic, the transistors are is polysil polysilicon uh, crossed by diffusion. So red in this uh, diagram is the diffusion, and then the polysilicon is the black. And so, uh, as you remember, the diffusion and polysilicon uh, is a MOSFET. Uh, obviously, the gates are the polysilicon. And so we have our inputs uh, connected to the gates, the polysilicon, and uh, the diffusion is crossing one another. So we draw them, uh, each of them, uh, on the thing. And not always are you able to draw them as straight lines, but in this case, we I was able to, and it uh, helps for simplicity's sake. So I just drew them on uh, straight lines uh, connecting the pull up and pull down circuit. You'll see that the top portion of the schematic is our pull up circuit and the bottom portion is the pull down circuit. So next what we want to do, uh, and it kind of just helps to uh, get your brain uh, ready to put all the pieces together, is label the source and drain uh, for all of it. In a uh, PMOS transistor, the source is connected to the higher voltage while the drain is connected to the lower voltage. And in an NMOS transistor, the drain is connected to the higher voltage and the source is connected to the lower voltage. And so I uh, labeled that in all the schematic that we were created for our, uh, our example. And uh, I labeled that also on our uh, diagram of the actual chip that we're going to be creating. And as you can see, I kind of labeled them a little differently. You'll see why uh, in, a, in an, a moment when I draw out the different connections to actually connect the two. But our, our, our idea and our logic behind this is we want to match it up exactly what it is uh, in that diagram on the very right. So we want to have the in our pull up circuit, we want to have the source of A connected to VCC. We want to have the source of uh, the input D connected to VCC. And then we want ABC all in parallel. And then the drain of C and the drain of D connected to, uh, with the drain of the input D in the pull down circuit. And then that will be where our output is. And so oppositely, you want all the sources uh, connected of ABC, of the, all the sources connected to ground, and then the, all the drains of ABC connect to the source of the input D in the pull-down circuit. And so uh, I labeled it a little differently, uh, or not a little differently, but a little odd. I didn't, uh, they're, they're not just all source drain, source drain, source drain, source drain uh, on that uh, fabrication of the actual chips. And this is mainly to, when you end up having to do this, you have to try optimizing it uh, as much as possible because uh, the larger the chip, the more contacts you need to add, the more metal pieces that you have to add to connect the different chips, uh, the larger the chip's gonna be and the more expensive it's gonna be. So you wanna optimize it so that it's the smallest chip that's actually possible and uh, for the purposes, obviously size uh, is not only just wanted by the customer, but it also saves money. So that's what we end up doing. And you'll see in a second when I draw it that uh, it actually does, it makes more sense to draw, uh, draw the sources and drains how I did. So what I ended up doing, uh, kind of following that schematic, uh, I just connected it following it how, uh, how we wanted it. So obviously the sources of the uh, input A and input D were connected to VCC, uh, the input, uh, the the sources of ABC are all connected to ground uh, on the pull down circuit. And so I kind of have that there. Uh, and so the X's in this case are the contacts while the green is the metal. And so there are multiple metals that you're able to use, especially if you want to overlay or uh, get uh, kind of different layers in the different chip that you're designing. But in this case, we only needed one. And uh, as you see, they're not, they don't overlap. So there's no need to use another metal. Uh, but there are, uh, we're able to get our necessary requirements with everything that's here. And so what we're going to have to do after we compare it to the actual 
uh, schematic once more is we're gonna have to size this thing and get a size estimate. How large is it gonna be? So uh, that we understand what we actually designed and if it can be optimized. Questions, anyone wanna look at it a little longer? All right. So just showing the diagram again, um, you can compare the two. Uh, you can kind of see why I put the sources and drains uh, where they need to be so that uh, if I put the source drain, source drain, source drain, then I would have had three contacts all trying to connect it on the pull down circuit, connecting it to ground. Uh, while in this case, I only need two because the source of B and C on that left diagram are uh, connected together. Uh, and so I was able to kind of combine the two and save another contact, save a little space. And same with the drains of A and B, I uh, connected, I was able to connect both of those two and attach it to the drain of C and the source of D in the pull down circuit, and then connect the DRE to the connection point of the pull up circuit. And uh, the pull up circuit's a little more simple. Obviously they're all in parallel, uh, A, B, and C all, are all in parallel. And then the third one, uh, input D is, uh, is they're all in series, my apologies. Uh, they're all in series and then the input D is in parallel. So uh, it kind of just follows the same. It's a little more simple than the bottom and uh, you connect it to the pull down circuit and then you use that as the output. And so with whatever uh, different schematic that you have, you would end up doing the same process. You would draw those VCC and ground rails, then you would draw the all the different transistors that we were using. We had four inputs uh, and four transistors for the pull up and uh, four transistors for the pull down. Uh, so we drew those transistors and then we would um, kind of draw the source and drains uh, of both the pull up and pull down and then try to optimize the size as much as possible. So uh, we did that with ours in particular for our, our example, and then uh, attach it with metal so that it matches our actual schematic so that we're getting the function that we want. And then here's a, a better drawn photo of an inverter that I found uh, online where uh, you can see here that uh, it's it's just an inverter. Obviously, we have those we have the VCC and ground rails on the top and bottom. Uh, we have the diffusion and the polysilicon. Uh, in this case, the they specify the difference between a PMOS and an NMOS diffusion, and then the polysilicon that crosses the two. And then we have uh, the connections uh, connecting it and to the output of Y. All right, for the, uh, once we get to the, once we end up designing uh, kind of, that's a top look of a uh, of the chip that we're gonna design. Uh, we obviously, you need to fabricate it. And one of the, uh, one of the like best questions that I had for like a, a 435 course was uh, kind of a, a fabrication process and how it looks if you were to cut it in half, how does the chip actually end up looking? But you do need the size uh, and that kind of overlook uh, allows us to look over it kind of uh, be able to approximate the size. And so uh, I, I showed uh, last week how the size of a MOSFET is that feature size, the space of the channel, and uh, how these uh, different chips are measured are in the measurement of lambda, which is the feature size divided by two. So it's half of the channel, and that is the, the general standard for which that we measure the channel uh, or we measure the actual size. And so there are a whole bunch of different requirements that you need to follow when you're designing these that the fab houses not only know, but they uh, need to be followed for, uh, so that not only connections don't, if you get so close uh, in these different connections, then electrons can jump, it can cause a whole bunch of different issues. And so there's uh, different standards that you, that you need to use, such as like diffusion is two times in width, uh, but, mainly for our purposes and necessarily for simple designs you were able to approximate and uh get a very an accurate uh, result because the largest uh actual things in our schematic are the contacts and the uh, metal wires that are connected so the contacts are four wide and they need an extra four lambda of uh, spacing. That way there's no actual issues. And the same goes with the metal that is connecting all of the different parts together. And so they need their four uh, lambda in width, and then they need four lambda extra for spacing uh, 
so that they work properly. And so this requires eight lambda in total for the contacts in metal. And so we can uh, get the sizing of our schematic by counting the different contacts and different metal wires that we have and um, multiplying it by eight lambda. So we can see here in the uh, right side that uh, I went through it and I uh, counted uh, the different lines that we have the, of, the, of the metal and the contacts that we have. So we have the first one being, being the uh, ground rail. We have the second one being the contacts where it connects to the, um, the VCC, uh, that connects to the actual transistors. We have the third one being that connection point of the pull up and pull down uh, networks. We have the fourth one being that connecting point of the drains and uh, the source of input D on the pull down network. Uh, you can see how it goes over and then uh, to the right side. And then uh, the fifth one is obviously the contacts to the transistors on the pull down network. And the sixth one is the ground rail and the contacts that connect to it. And so uh, on that was the height. And then the width is the contacts for obviously connected to the source of input A, the contacts of uh, the and the metal line that is uh, connecting the drains of A and B, the inputs A and B on the pull down network. Uh, number three is um, the connecting the sources of B and C to the ground rail, the contacts and metal strip there. And then the fourth one is the connecting the drain of input C and the source of input D, uh, the different actual contact there and the metal rail that's there. And then the fifth one is obviously uh, the contact connected to the input of uh, the drain of input D and then the metal wire that comes up and connects it to the, the uh, pull up network. And so uh, what we end up doing is because we have the five, uh, five as the width and then six as the height, we're able to multiply the six times eight lambda because that's what required is four for the actual uh, contacts and the, the metal and then four for extra for spacing. And then the width as uh, five. So we're able to multiply it by eight as well. And we get 48 lambda and 40 lambda. And so we're able to get the area of uh, 1,920 lambda squared. And this lambda uh, again represents uh, it's half of the feature size. So this is the, the technology that we end up using. Uh, I mentioned there, there was reported technology of seven nanometers. Uh, in this process, I just approximated a, a random uh, technology that we're using at 16 nanometers. And so uh, the area we end up getting is 491,520 nanometers squared. And so that, that way we're able to approximate the area of the actual chip. Uh, seven nanometers is just uh, uh, obviously extremely small for a transistor, uh, but it is obviously just the size of the feature, uh, the feature size of a transistor. And when we end up making these into functions, uh, we have to uh, take into account the actual function of the chip, uh, how the size of it, how it's going to fit it, and everything. Uh, any questions? All right. So now we'll go into a little bit of the uh, fabrication process. And uh, you'll see on the bottom as we go through here, this is a cut in look of the actual, um, of the uh, CMOS design that we ended up making. So if you were to cut the CMOS design in half and you were looking at all the different contacts and the different transistors that we have there, you may not be able to see it at uh, all the transistors because um, of the uh, actual, depth of it obviously we're just getting a little snapshot of it but this is also a, an important part to understand how these are created and so uh first part obviously from a silicon wafer uh we have it as a p substrate so it'd be holes uh, after doping uh we grow a uh, silicon oxide uh on top of the silicon wafer and this is done by doing an oxidation furnace at 900 to 1200 degrees celsius uh, and so obviously you put that silicon oxide layer on top of the silicon uh, wafer. And then we end up, uh, next we put a photoresist uh, a layer on top of the silicon oxide. And so the photoresist layer is uh, light sensitive, meaning that if we expose it to light, it softens and then is able to be removed. So that this makes it so that we're able to add our wells later on. So the, uh, once we expose one portion, that portion is able to be manipulated, we're able to, and add an N well uh, if we're doing uh, an N MOS, uh, a P MOS, et cetera. And so uh, that's important. Uh, it allows us to actually work at a small area and, and change it uh, 
with just the use of uh, the sun to be able to expose and kind of uh, relinquish it. So what they end up doing is putting like a little layer on top of the photoresist and only expose a portion of it to, uh, to, to light. And then that portion gets soft and then they scrape it away. So uh, once that part is uh, stripped off, uh, you, oh, you expose the photoresist through an NWL uh, mask and then strip off the exposed photoresist. So kind of how I said, uh, you only expose it to a certain area and then you uh, uh, scrape it off so that uh, it's that area is now exposed. And that part, you're gonna add a, a new part, a new portion to the NMOS design. So then we etch the oxide with hydrofluoric acid, uh, well, hydrofluoric acid. Uh, and this is uh, really uh, bad stuff. Obviously it, it can go through your skin and eat your bone. Uh, and it is extremely uh, acidic and is not safe. To, so it really has to be in these important areas. And I kind of stated last week that all this is extremely uh, sensitive. They do it in huge fab houses where uh, everything is like dust. I'd, when you're playing at this small of levels and nanometer technology, uh, a very small portion of dust can have a huge impact and make the chip not able to work. So there is a, a, a large uh, concentration on making sure that the uh, environment that these are created are specific and not able to be manipulated by the environment. Uh, but the, we expose it to the, the acid, uh, we etch the oxide, and uh, only attacks oxide where resist has been exposed. So now we are attached to the actual silicon wafer. Uh, we're able to uh, affect only silicon wafer now that the silicon oxide is uh, also removed from the spot that we wanted it to be removed. The photoresist is still on. And now we remove the photo photoresist uh, on top of the layer. Uh, it was only needed to remove that one portion. And now that uh, that's no longer needed for this portion, we uh, uh, remove it all together. So we strip off remaining photoresist, use mixture of acids, uh, and then we the necessary so resist doesn't melt in next step. So the end well, uh, we next add the end well. Uh, the end well is formed with diffusion or ion implementation. Uh, so the diffusion, you use, you place the wafer in the furnace with arsenic gas, uh, the heat until the uh, arsenic atoms uh, diffuse into the exposed silicon. And so uh, this kind of goes into how the paint junctions are created, how you dope it, uh, or how you dope it correctly. And so uh, this is why the uh, photoresist uh, needed to be removed because it would obviously have melted. Uh, ion implementation, which is uh, another way other than diffusion, you blast the wafer with beam of uh, arsenic ions, uh, ions blocked by silicon oxide, only ex enter exposed silicon. So these are two ways that you're able to create that end well, uh, depending on the actual design that you'll need. You could, uh, would depend on how many end wells you need, how many P, uh, how many P wells you need, et cetera. Uh, but for this case, uh, we're creating an inverter. Uh, that is the example that we're showing here. Uh, we only need uh, this, we need this end well. We actually will be adding another one, but uh, this end well is needed. And you can see that it doesn't always uh, go directly to uh, right under where it is exposed. And this is because the diffusion uh, goes a little further. The, uh, just because uh, it's right on top, it seeps through a little further than the exposed area. And then we strip off the oxide uh, using uh, hydrofluoric acid uh, back to the bare wafer. And so this kind of uh, sets us up. And so we're gonna use this process uh, to make whatever we ended up, whatever we end up needing uh, for our design. And so uh, now that we started all over again, we kind of got a repeatable process that we're able to follow. So uh, obviously we need the thin gate oxide and the uh, polysilicon because we're making a, the transistors. We need that uh, insulation and the polysilicon on top of it to uh, create the transistors. And so uh, you deposit a very thin layer of gate oxide uh, and then uh, use chemical vapor uh, deposition of silicon layer, place wafer in furnace, and then uh, forms many small crystal crystals called polysilicon, heavily doped to be a good conductor. And so this will be used as our gate, uh, depending on how many inputs that we need uh, that we'll be able to use. And so in this case, because uh, it's an inverter, we have the N-well and then P-well and how to make a CMOS polysilicon patterning. Uh, so you, uh, this is just showing the 3D effect kind of from that old different uh, 
schematic that we drew, uh, the overlay that where we had an overview of the schematic. Uh, this is connecting both of the different gates as you would in, a, in, a, in an inverter. Um, but we don't see that in this diagram. So this is just showing how uh, you, it would be seen. So we applied the gates to both the P substrate and the end well. And then we uh, use oxide masking to expose where the end dopage should be diffused or implanted. End diffusions forms end loss uh, source drain and end well contact. And so this is just a layer on top. And then uh, how to make CMOS end diffusion uh, pattern oxide and form N plus regions. Uh, so in N well, this is uh, a little more heavily doped, uh, able to get in there. And so uh, it creates the actual end diffusion areas and um, creates a well that we're able to pull more electrons from because it's a, uh, a well that is able to be uh, more than just the, the N well that's uh, more electrons in the, the N plus diffusion area than the, there is in the N well. So if we, there are needed more electrons in the process, uh, if it's op operating at a high uh, usage, then it's able to pull it from the N plus area. And so we add the uh, different well, the different, um, we add the actual well. So now we have that N MOS uh, transistor on the left. And we're going to get a PMOS on the right. If, obviously, if you put P pluses in a P substrate, uh, it doesn't work properly. That's not how you uh, create a PMOS transistor. So we had to create that N well so that we are able to put the P pluses in there. Um, historically, dopants were diffused, usually on implementation today, but regions are still called diffusion. And then we strip it off. Uh, again, we're at a process that uh, we're able to repeat. And so we do the same with our P plus or uh, P wells. So we create that P region on the right. Uh, we create that uh, P MOS on the right and the N MOS is already created. And you can see that there's N plus and P plus. And like I said, that N plus and P plus is used. So if there are uh, extra holes or extra electrons that are needed, they're able to be drawn from. It's kind of like a, a tap that you're able to use for the, uh, the process. And then uh, now we need to, to wire together the devices, cover chip with thick oxide, uh, etch oxide where con uh, contact cuts are needed. Uh, so we already developed the transistors. Now we need to create the contacts that we gave the fab house uh, in our, our case. And so now we're putting on the contacts for this particular MOSFET. And then we add the metal uh, to the, to the uh, CMOS design. And so this just pulls together our actual uh, our uh, chip and whatever design that you give it to, this is the process that they'll end up using. And I believe this is it. Yeah, so that is all of the actual presentation. Does anyone have any questions for me? All right, well, uh, I appreciate everyone coming. I believe that's all I have to share. I'll stick around for a couple, uh, for five to 10 minutes if anyone has any other questions other than that. I appreciate everyone coming and I hope you guys learned something. Thanks, Michael. That's great. No problem. <laughs>